Southampton mark their return to St Mary's with a half-fought point against Manchester United in front of a packed stadium for the first time in 17 months. And wasn't it good to be back? Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Total Saints podcast. My name is Martin Stark and each week I'm joined by our panel of experts to reflect on all things Southampton Football Club. Coming up this week, reaction to the Manchester United game, an in-depth look at our potential new arrival from Torino and we'll throw forward to a busy week with two games coming up. Once again, a big welcome to our resident Saints experts. With us is writer of the blog League One Minus Ten, Glenn Delacour. Uh, how much of the game did you see in the end, Glenn? Was it all good? Yeah, so, uh, first, first of all, I'm a bit uncomfortable with being called an expert. <laughs> 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 really just guy with an opinion uh, that'll do um i saw all the game i was in the ground at 20 past one i was fortunate i guess in that all three of the tickets that i needed to arrive did arrive the latest one the, the, the last one sorry dropped through the door on uh on saturday morning so i didn't have to make a special trip to get a temporary ticket or anything like that um, the only issue I had was is that the actual tickets that came through, the plastic cards didn't scan. Um, and I know the club has released a statement, which I know you're going to go on to in a minute. So so some poor guy had to type in, I think, a 12 digit number on the which, you know, which was on which is on the bottom of the season ticket cards. So he had to do that for every fan who um, whose whose card didn't scan. So. Uh, but, we, you know, we got there in plenty of time. I, you know, I'm lucky I live local. You know, I'm only about four miles away. So it, it's it's not too much of an imposition for me to get there sort of 20 minutes earlier. But I know a lot of people, you know, especially out-of-town fans who've got, got a bigger journey. This was a, a real massive inconvenience to them. And, and uh, it's never easy for somebody to type in a 12-digit number when you're being watched either. So respect <laughs> to all the stewards <laughs> that were doing that today. Owner of Saints Web, Steve Grant, is also back with us this week. How was your afternoon at the game, Steve? Uh, yeah, really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, great to see some some old faces that I've not seen for the best part of 18 months. And yeah, perfect weather for it as well, though I've um, just got home and it's absolutely hammering it down. So uh, kind of... Yeah, basically passed, got onto the M25 and all of a sudden the black cloud just um, just appeared over the horizon, which I don't know, kind of kind of sends a message, I, su- I suppose, in, in many ways. But no, it was, um, no, it was a great, great afternoon, I thought. Deserved point, probably should have got more, but we don't tend, don't tend to beat United at home, so uh, take what we can get, I think. Do you think last season that is absolutely a game that we lose 2-1, 3-1? Four one five one. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, as soon as they equalised, I thought, "Oh God, here we go again." Um, but I mean, I, I thought that the halftime sub made a lot of sense in many ways. But it just it just took them a few took them about ten fifteen minutes to kind of get into the into the swing of things. Um, once it was irritating that basically as soon straight after they equalised, we seemed to settle down and, and be quite comfortable in in the in the sort of readjusted system. But no, I thought we were. We were good. We were good value today, and it showed that we can put on a second half performance. Um, I think the fitness levels and stamina levels need a little bit of work because we had three or four players that looked like they were struggling with various cramps um, towards the end of the game. Um, which, to be fair, in that heat is not uh, entirely unexpected. Um, but yeah, at least at least we were we were there all the way to the end in that. Um, in that game today, when yeah, certainly last season we'd have we'd have completely wilted under even the slightest of pressure. And I'm also pleased to say that we're joined by the Athletics dedicated Saints reporter Dan Sheldon, who is out of isolation. Dan and back at the game today. Yeah, out of isolation, and yeah, I was, I was very much at St Mary's today. I was I was there even earlier than Glenn. I think I got there just after midday. So. Excellent. Yeah, I was able to, to watch the ground fill up, which I've not been able to do for, for 18 months. So, yeah, it was nice. Well, as always, a big thank you to all the patrons, because without your continued support, none of this would be possible. And a big welcome to episode 165 of the Total Saints podcast. This is the Total Saints podcast with Martin Stark, Steve Grant, Glenn Delacour and the Athletics' Dan Sheldon. Before we get on to today's game against Manchester United, let's start with that club statement because uh, this is something which I don't think has ever happened in all my years of supporting, well, football, let alone Southampton. Uh, Problems with the turnstiles today, a club statement issued 
probably about 20 minutes after kickoff, says the club would like to apologise for the frustrations caused by issues regarding match tickets and entry to the stadium today and is already working on a full investigation into these issues. We will be issuing a full refund for this game to every general admission ticket holder. Details of this process will be shared early next week. Once again, the club is extremely sorry for any inconvenience been a bit of a mess hasn't it Glenn uh yeah just a little bit (laughs) I mean you know Twitter is full of people with their with their stories about how the tickets not arrived and now they were going to make us have to make a special trip from Bristol or somewhere like that so it it has been a shambles and I've you know, that statement to me is the club putting their hand up and saying they kind of acknowledge it's been a shambles and you're right I've never I've never heard of a of a club offering to refund virtually everybody <laughs> it's funny I feel a bit uncomfortable with it because as I said earlier I was in the ground in plenty of time on the face of it it's a, it's a good thing that the club are offering to um to refund the money for the inconvenience that's uh that's been been caused as you know it's not exactly like they haven't had 18 months to prepare for this or anything like that so, so a bit uh, like you I think I was in probably about 20 past one today just enjoying a pint and a pie really unaware of what was going on so when they made the announcement we were sort of looking around going did they did they just say we're going to get our money back um and obviously there's always a few latecomers and it did seem there were more than normal perhaps sort of flooding in by still 20 minutes past I guess yeah exactly I was going to say that the, the woman who was sat next to me got in at about 25 to 3 so she'd missed the first 35 minutes I sort of um she looked so angry I didn't want to talk to her and ask her what had happened (laughs) (laughs) but I think we can guess it wasn't good we should say there's been a further statement as well from Toby Steele the managing director um so that all the details are starting to come through about this now have you ever heard of anything like this Dan it's it's a bit of an embarrassment for the club it's it's uh an embarrassment and it's a shambles I I don't think you can kind of cover it up in any kind of way. I don't think there's any excuses for it. Um, as Glenn said, the club have come out, they've put their hands up and accepted that, yep, we, we've messed up. And that that's, the, you know, the bare minimum. I think refunds are, yeah, I mean, again, it's just kind of that, that's sort of bare minimum as, as, to, as to what they can do. I mean, it's generous. They're going to be refunding everybody. But then, I, I mean, I don't know if they have the technology, but I guess it's very difficult to work out if season... Ticket number, I don't know, 10 entered the ground at 12 minutes past one. I mean, I don't know if they have the technology that can work that stuff out. So they probably do, but it probably doesn't work. <laughs> so I guess it's probably easier to just do a, a blanket refund and just refund everyone. But yeah, you know, I, I do, it, it, it's an embarrassment. I think that is the right word. And then I would add shambles. It's, you know, it's on the back of today was on the back of problems with getting season tickets out to supporters. Now, that in itself, I think the, the the statement added that you know there was there were issues with the supplier, but you know other clubs used a, the same supplier and they've managed to to figure something out. So yeah, it, it's just not a good look for for Southampton today, and it's a shame because it kind of you know it, people are talking about this rather than what was actually quite a good performance in the end that you know, they've had to put out this statement and put a negative slant on on what was otherwise a good day. We could probably fill a whole separate podcast with the the ticket office and the ticketing website at the moment, Glenn, because I know you and I have had uh, similar frustrations with that whilst trying to secure tickets for this season. Uh, yeah. Um, well, you know, these people, they're not trying to mess up. They're, they're trying their best. But it, sometimes, I mean, I, I work in IT. Sometimes you need to take a big step back to take a step forward. And it, it, it seems like, it seems to me like they keep trying solutions that will hopefully work in the short term, but just seem to make things worse. The website and the way you select seats and stuff like that. I mean, I, I had lots of issues with the friendlies and eventually I didn't bother. You know, we can't be the best on the pitch because we don't have enough money to compete with the the likes of uh, Manchester United who we saw today, um, you know, even though we got a rare point against them, but we should be able to get all the stuff off the pitch right. And it's, it's as, as Dan said, it's it's not a good look when it's uh, when it doesn't work out the way it should. Okay, well, let's move on to the game. Um, and as you said, um, a really a, a well-earned point against Manchester United. I must just say, we did a little poll um, on our Twitter at Total Saints pods, uh, 24 hours before kickoff. What was the match predictions? Uh, 66% of people thought that we would lose today. So um, if I listen back to our prediction from last week, I think we were all in agreement that we might have got a hiding off the back of the goals that uh, Manchester United have scored against Leeds. So it was a pleasant surprise, I think, today, Glenn. 
It was. I mean, I wasn't, I think like most people, when I saw the unchanged team, that was a, a sharp intake of breath moment because um, I think everybody expected there to be changes from last week. But to be fair, you know, they, they, they went out there and um, did what they had to do. Rode our luck a little bit in the first half. Some of our defending from set plays. I mean, the, the first four United crosses into the box, it, it was like, someone had chucked a hand grenade in a box. It was just ridiculous. There was just people falling over all over the place. No one seemed to be marking anybody. Free headers all over the place. And, and somehow we got away with those. But we we rode our luck, scored a goal, which again took a big deflection, which was a, a little bit of luck. And, uh, you know, got to, got to half time. And I think in the second half, everyone expected it to be, you know, the same old, same old. We're one nil up at half time. We're just going to cave in, do what we normally do, run out of steam. That's the end of that. But, um, the, you know, the Ralph was proactive and changed the formation at the start of the second half whilst we were winning, which is what, you know, most people have been calling for him to make changes earlier. And he obviously saw something and um, and fancy changing it. And he did. And, you know, at the end of the day, we, we've got we've got a point. And with a, with a little bit more luck, to be honest, we probably look the side more likely to win it in the second half. But I think a point overall is, is very fair from a game that we could have won and we could have lost. So, yeah, I'm, I was uh, more than happy with it, to be honest. Uh, Dan, you wrote this week about the depth of squad that Ralph has at his disposal now. And uh, that first game against Everton, he was a bit reluctant to use the the bench in particular. We spoke about that last week. This week, completely different story. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if he subscribes to The Athletic, but... (laughs) Clearly does. (laughs) Uh, No, as as you say, it's... That's just kind of the point I was making on the back of the Everton game was that you know, he is saying that he's he's generally really happy with this squad whenever he's given the opportunity to say that. And we just want to see him use it. Um, and, and today he did use it. And he he even went to five at the back when he brought um, Jan Bednarek on at half time. Now, obviously, you, uh, Ralph, after the game, you know, kind of said it, it, it was a bit of a messy start, messy first 10 minutes into the second half. But Eventually, they they found their way and they did finish the stronger side. I thought Southampton. So, yeah, just just important that he's got this bench, but that he uses it. And after the game, he he said that he wishes he could make five subs. No, I I do question that. I mean, it, it, it took him bloody ages to make three last week. So <laughs> five may be pushing it for now for Ralph. But yeah, we can't um we can't complain at, at the changes he. Or I certainly wouldn't make any complaints at the changes he did make from a, a neutral's point of view. And who were the standout performers for you today, Glenn? The front two, I thought, linked up particularly well and uh, and, and a few stars at the back. The front two are going to be decent. You know, bearing in mind they're, they're new to each other's game. They are going to be improving all the time. It was a real shame that Armstrong missed that chance in the second half that would have made it 2-1 because I, I, I was I was more surprised that he missed you know, we, we've had some forwards, lots of them, over the years where you, they get in that situation and you know they're going to miss. Uh, with him, it, it, I actually found it more of a surprise that he did miss. I, but that aside, I thought he was excellent. What I like about him is that he, he sprints into every challenge. You know, he's closing down people really aggressively all the time. And you can see why um, that was an attractive thing for Ralph when he was looking for uh, a replacement for Danny Ings. I thought the pair of them looked looked excellent. At the back, I've got to mention Jack Stevens. I mean, he had he had one one wobbly moment where he kind of tried to dribble out of defence and then gave War Prowse a dodgy pass, which led to a free kick. But I I thought he was excellent. I also liked the fact that he he got in Bruno Fernandez's face as well. Yeah, and there, <laughs> there there was no you know he wasn't he wasn't taking a backward step there. He was calling out the the petulant little man baby for what he is and um making sure that <laughs> making sure that he, he knew um he was clearly getting irritated with fernandez trying to referee the game as well and he did a good job and it it occurred to me during the game why he's in the team it's possibly something to do with the fact that you know we've lost vestergaard's passing out of defense and i just thought oh actually stevens can actually pass the ball reasonably well so maybe that's the combination he's looking for one who can pass it and one who's more of a stopper and just maybe he thinks salisu and bednarek are, are too similar but it's it's whether the benefits you get from that outweigh the occasional defensive lapses that he um that he has but he he had a very good game today liveramento was excellent again and and you can see he's going to be he is going to be an absolutely top player and we should uh, just enjoy him while he's here because uh, I think it'll be it'll be for a while but it, it uh, 
he's certainly not going to retire as a Saints legend, having played 11, 12 seasons for us, that's for sure. Now, we do like to apportion blame. Can we blame anybody for that goal? Um, the keeper, the defenders, or just um, just unlucky, Steve? Uh, difficult. Um, difficult to tell. It was... I mean, Pogba, who... who I thought I had a really good game for them, um, which, I mean, he kind of needed to, given how bad Fred was alongside him. But, yeah, I mean, he, he kind of danced his way into the area, and it was one of those where you don't want the player to stick his leg out because it's going to be a penalty. But they, yeah, he, he kind of worked it worked it through, I think, to Fernandez on the corner of the six-yard box, and he somehow flicked it behind him. Um, I don't know whether Greenwood was wasn't marked tightly enough perhaps um the ball seemed to squirm through McCarthy a little bit as well um you kind of wonder whether I, I mean to be fair I thought McCarthy did quite well today um but you wonder whether Fraser Forster's bigger frame would have um would have would have stopped it or whether actually just Forster's uh, bigger sort of wider legs would have actually just allowed it straight through rather than rather than with us with a sort of slight fumble so uh, it's a difficult one. I mean, at the end of the day, other teams are allowed to score good goals. So, yeah, we'll we'll chalk that one up as mm, might have done a little bit better, but nobody really sort of to point the finger at, I, th- I don't think. And we did have a bit of fortune with our goal as well. I was surprised to see it go down as a Fred own goal. I mean, that's not an own goal, is it? It's, <laughs> no. it's, it's, it's nonsense, that. I think the Greenwood goal deflected a little bit off of Salisu. So, you know, if it's on target, it goes down to the striker, doesn't it? But... Uh... Yeah, I, th- I thought I don't think Greenwood particularly hit that cleanly, and it seemed to sort of go through Salisu and went past McCarthy's feet. Or you know, it was a, it was a strange goal. I've only seen it once on a very uh, dodgy resolution um, replay, so it, it's it's hard to tell. But I, I largely agree with Steve that I don't think you can really point the finger at anyone on that one. One thing I did want to touch on was the the fouls and the uh, the the way the game was refereed and the things that the referee let pass. And before the new season, the officials were told not to penalise the trivial stuff, allow the games to flow a bit better, pretty much like what we saw with um, with the Euros. Now Jurgen Klopp was really quite scathing about this yesterday after his match and he said it felt like we're going ten to fifteen years backwards. And he said if you like that sort of thing go and watch wrestling. How do we feel that the game flowed today? Because for me, I thoroughly enjoyed it as a fan. Um, did, did, did you notice anything different, really, Glenn? Did you, did you feel that it, it just played a bit better? Well, Man United are arguing that our goal would have been disallowed because Stevens got the ball off of Bruno, who went down like he'd been shot, uh, as usual. I think the, the big clubs have kind of bought it on themselves. You know, Jurgen Klopp, to be fair to him, had just come off a game against Burnley. Now you know teams like Burnley are going to are going to take any sort of leniency from referees and and crank it up to the max with regards to to smashing into tackles and things like that. So yes, I think you know Klopp Klopp's coming off of playing playing against Burnley, but then he's had Mohamed Salah diving around all over the place for the last three or four seasons. So you you, you can't have it both ways. In answer to the original question, I, I, yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed the game. There didn't seem to be too many decisions where you were throwing your arms up and going why on earth has he given that normally against Manchester United you 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 come off and you've you've lost the free kick count by you know 15 to 4 or something like that but today it seemed fairly even and there didn't seem to be any particularly soft ones given so yeah I was I was quite happy with it um it had gone too far the other way where the, the slightest touch was resulting in a free kick and usually a yellow card so it's uh from our point of view, it's it's great to see like Romeo and Salasu not holding back, and um, because that's that's one of the weapons we've got when we play against teams like Man United, who have got basically superior players. You know the the old adage of get stuck into them, see how much they uh, see how much they fancy. So you've got, you've got a little bit more license to do that now, and I think it can only be a good thing. I thought Romeo had a good game, by the way. Um, I've seen sort of conflicting people on Twitter saying, oh, you know, he wasn't as good, and it'd be better to see somebody else in there. But um, I thought him. And Pogba in the middle was was quite a good matchup, Steve. Yeah, it was. Um, I mean, they're obviously di- very different players, but certainly, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't agree with anybody who said Romeo had a bad game. I thought <laughs> I thought that midfield battle was interesting. I mean, Fred Fred was poor for United, but he was still involved, and we kind of still had to had to win the ball off of him. And 
and get going the other way. And I thought Romeo and, and Ward Prowse were were both very good at, at what they always do. Diallo, when he came on, was was excellent as well. Actually, I think um, that's that substitution was actually the one that kind of wrestled the control in the second half back in our favour. Um, and I think Walker Peters on on the left gave us um, a fair amount of uh, composure, plenty of pace as well, which. I, I don't. I don't think United were expecting us to attack as much as we did in the second half, and we managed to push them back a fair, a fair bit. Um, caused caused them quite quite a few problems. And Dan, that last twenty minutes, um, that's something that we've not been used to. Uh, I don't know if Ralph touched on this after the game, but he must have been happy with the way we 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 saw it out because we're not we're certainly not used to that at St Mary's. Definitely, he was. Um, yeah, he was. He was obviously over the moon. I think he. He made a big call today by sticking with the same eleven that lost to Everton uh, last weekend. I, I thought I, I, I fully expected Walker Peters and, and Co to, to come back into the team and play play against United, a, a better team, uh, and you know have a bit more experience. But I asked him about the experience side of things in the week, and he, he essentially said young players have to start somewhere, and he backed them today. and the way they saw the game out, I actually I thought they finished a better side. I, I really did, and I think a, a big part of that is is the crowd. I thought the crowd for the last kind of 20, 15, 10 minutes were, were really good at, at getting behind Southampton, and, and they were they were very vocal. And you could just imagine that it, it, an empty St Mary's when Mason Greenwood scores his goal, it's the players get a bit deflated, but straight away the fans were were on Southampton's backs in a good way, like kind of urging them back on and. Yeah, I think Ralph will be delighted with how that game finished today. Um, absolutely over the moon. I've already been told by several people that are closer to him than, than I am that he, he's really happy with, with what he saw. Do you think it was the waistcoat? The, well, yeah, he did joke after the game. Someone <laughs> asked him about that, actually. Because they, they were... they were pre- I mean, his, his looks in pre-season were even more maverick. I mean, the one with the, the checked trousers and the chain. I mean, that, that really was quite something. And then he reverted to the tracksuit for Goodison Park. So I, I was thoroughly disappointed. But he, he said in the, in the post-match press conference that if it meant winning points, he'd wear Speedos. So uh, that, that would be a fantastic... Oh, good, oh, good Lord. <laughs> that would be a fantastic sight to see at, at St. Mary's. I that, just imagine Ralph walking out the tunnel in, in Speedos, all for three points. I mean, that, that's commitment if, if you ever need one. You'd get arrested, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> I can see the uh, the megastore doing a line in lucky waistcoats uh, if, if we win again. Yeah, so. maybe. Well, Gareth Southgate started the trend, didn't he, in 2018? So maybe Ralph's going to bring it back. You're listening to the Total Saints podcast, going to the heart of all things Saints FC. The news this week is that Southampton have agreed a deal in principle to sign Torino defender Lianco. Um, what's the latest with that, Dan? Where are we at the moment? Do we know? Yes, yeah, so the, the club, uh, you know, I think I last reported ahead of the weekend that they'd uh, agreed a deal in principle. And yeah, it, all things being well, here be a Southampton player. The, the club, you know, think they've got their man. And yeah, by all intents and purposes, he, he is set to become... Yannick Vestergaard's replacement. Uh, I, I've not heard of any major hiccups. I've not heard of any hiccups whatsoever. So, yeah, I think with that, uh, yeah, he is going to be their, their newest defender. Do you think that's a good addition, Glenn, or do we just not know enough about him at the moment? I'm going to be completely honest. I had never heard of him. Yeah. Um, I, I just, I did the did the classic old thing and stuck the YouTube highlight reel on. And um, <laughs> what, what you can see is that he can certainly pass the ball. So that's, that's why... They're interested in him because that's the one thing that we've lost with um, with losing Vestergaard is is someone who can uh, someone who can pass the ball from from defence. So he's he definitely ticks that particular box. Whether whether he turns out to be the answer is um, will be down to how well he can defend. Obviously, he's a big lad. He seems to be you know the the, the word is that he's relatively quick, but the, there are a few a few questions shall we say about his uh, about the quality of his defending. Torino. I think finished near the bottom of Serie A last year. Didn't get relegated, but weren't far off. So it's hard to see with the sort of question marks against him. It's it's hard at this point to see him being outstanding. But 
you never know. He might be. Obviously, people have scouted him who know a lot more about him than I do. So, yeah, you never know. We've got to trust people on this one and, and hope that he's a, another gem that we've 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 plucked for not very much money and not another Wesley Hoyt. It does feel a bit different than that, doesn't it, Steve? It feels like those days are behind us to a certain extent. And actually, for the money, for, for six million or seven million euros, I think it was, it this might be a gamble that pays off. I think every ultimately every transfer is a gamble, regardless of whether you pay nothing or or fifty million quid. Um, it's just how how much um, you as a club can afford that gamble um, if it goes wrong. And obviously, we've seen in the past where I mean, we could all list off the the, the obvious names. Um, I mean, taking taking one of them as a, as a prime example, Wesley Hoot, who we paid forty million quid for. I mean, if this guy, I mean, this guy, we're paying seven million quid. So theoretically, um, there should be half the level of expectation on his shoulders. Um, which, given how how um, low Wesley's performances were, I think um, I think he'll he'll struggle to not uh, match those expectations at the very least. So I think, yeah, I mean, uh, similar to Glenn, I've, I've I'd not heard of this guy before. Um, before he sudden, before all of a sudden, this was a, um, this was kind of a done deal. But the only slight concern I have is that the problems we have defensively are of a sort of organisational and communication um, issue. Now you're bringing in a Brazilian who presumably speaks Italian perfectly well and port- and obviously is native Portuguese. Don't know, no idea what his English is like. Um, no idea whether he speaks Polish or French to communicate with our other central defenders. So it's how how are we improving our defensive communication and coordination with with this signing? Um, is he going to slot straight into the first team? I I mean I I assumed when we were we were looking for a Vestergaard replacement, it was someone to hopefully come straight in. Um, yeah. Given that that we thought that the the other three weren't as a as a group weren't necessarily up to it. I mean, individually, you could put them with one sort of strong, def- strong communicative defender, and the levels of of that partnership might be better than any of the other combinations that we've got at the moment. But I'm not. Sh- it's 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 a difficult one. I I like that we're thinking outside the box, and we. It, I mean, this is clearly an analytical signing uh, based on the. I mean, the, like the Twitter response from Torino fans seems to have been, "Why do they want this guy?" But I mean, who knows? I mean, they 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 obviously see something in him. So, I mean, wait and see. We did manage to track down the only person who supports Southampton and Torino, and would describe themselves as a super fan. And this is Toro Rob seventy six on Twitter, and he seems to think that it would be quite a good deal. He says the majority of Torino fans have been celebrating his departure, which is never a good sign. But his relationship with the supporters has never recovered since celebrating a victory against his parent club whilst on loan at Bologna. So maybe that <laughs> is the source of the uh, the upset and the resentment that's I mean, on the, Twitter the, at the, the moment. The loan, the loan rules in other countries are either um, brilliant or absolutely mad. Because, I, I mean, it just seems like such a lose-lose situation for everybody to allow a player on loan to play against you. I mean, personally, I, I would say you're not allowed to loan players... Um, to teams in the same division because there's just a just a huge and very obvious conflict of interests there. But then, I mean, that would that would basically kill the business plan of Chelsea. So, I mean, you Torino, um, Torino may well have been paying his wages. You know, they might have been paying eighty percent of his wages or something. Yeah. Rob, Rob does say um, he said he'd probably be initially used as a third or fourth choice centre back in a similar way to Salazu when he signed last summer. Earlier today, I spoke with Nima Tavavelli, who's a sports journalist and founder of Semprenta.com. He's also one third of the Italian football podcast. Hi, Nima. How are you? I'm good. How are you guys? Yeah, very well. We're a bit confused um, because we've signed a player that none of us have really heard of. So I'm hoping that you <laughs> might be able to tell us a bit more about uh, about Lianco and the player that we're going to get in Southampton. Um, well, he's he's a 24 year old. He turns 25 in, in February. Uh, player with uh, who who's born in Brazil. Uh, his paternal grandfather is Serbian. So his full name is Lianco Evangelista Silveira Neves Vojnovic, which is rather um, different. Uh, that mix of Serbia and Brazil. He, you know, he can play for both. He, he decided to play for the Brazilian under-23s at um, a youth level, but he also played for Serbia under-19s. Um, he joined Torino uh, in the summer of 2017, or it was, it was the deal was announced in March. 
March um, that he'd come to Torino for about six, seven million euros, including add-ons. And it was an express requ- re- request by the then manager, excuse me, then manager Sinisa Mihailovic, also Serbian, who uh, wanted a central defender who was a bit quicker than the ones he had. Um, they sent him out on loan to Bologna the, during the... Uh, uh, during the 1819 season, um, and that's really when he had his best spell in in the Serie A. And uh, it, it's been it's been strange because he was a player that Torino really counted on, and, and was really were really counting on on building and and to, per, to potentially uh, stri- um, make uh, you know sell on for for rather hefty fee. But it didn't turn out that way, unfortunately for for Torino. And, and his spell at Torino is is somewhat a bit. Mm, weird for most people. I, I interviewed were Diego Fornaro, who's a Torino one of the best journalists in Italy covering Torino and he, he was his his reaction was we expected so much and and I think he did as well but now it, it never really materialized because it was a very turbulent period in Torino's you know it was a very turbulent period th- throughout his time in in the club's uh, history so to speak um, they almost got relegated last season and they shouldn't have been anywhere near that uh, they had a sporting director Petracchi who resigned to go to Roma and there was a lot of arguing back in there and there was no one in charge of the sporting project they hired Marco Giampaolo who would had absolutely no business being there because uh, the owner Urbano Cairo couldn't get Ivan Juric, who is now there. So it's it's been quite chaotic, if chaotic, chaotic few years there. So I think um, so I think for him, uh, you know, he's not too motivated to stay at Torino. He's been looking to go away from Torino pretty much all summer. Um, there was talks of Real Betis that deal never materialized. So I think it's um, it's it's a good thing for everyone involved. So we will look, obviously, at the Torino results. We'll look at their uh, results last season. We'll look at the amount of goals they conceded, where they finished in the league. We'll notice that he wasn't really a, a regular for the side over the last four years. Are you saying that might be more to do with the club and the management and the way it was run and we, we shouldn't focus on that too much when we're thinking about the, the individual and the player? I wouldn't think at all about it. Um when uh, when when trying to judge him because Torino have been a mess for two three years now pretty much yeah pretty much since the sporting director Petracchi left to go to Roma um, they've been they've been searching to find their new identity and their new sporting project and now they have found that with Ivan Juric taking over um, and and giving them the stability and and a clear uh, coherent line uh, lines in terms of how they want to play um, so uh, Willianco I I I wouldn't stare at all at that because Torino have been in turmoil uh, and they, I mean they've got a good side and and they still and they were almost got relegated last season and they had no business being down the bottom where they were I think this what's the, the best thing that could have happened for all parties involved was to part way, ways and I think that um, Southampton are getting a young player a young defender who is very hungry um, he's he he wants to forget his period in in the Serie A with Torino um, because it was it wasn't good for anyone uh, and, and he struggled the club struggled and he'll come to to Southampton looking to redeem himself looking to build, you know get a kickstart re, you know restart his career um, and obviously playing in the Premier League is, is a great opportunity for him it certainly seems like he's a player who doesn't really lack self-confidence. Um, he's quite uh, he's he, he's quite positive about his self and his ability on social media, for example, because that's yeah. what we can really grasp at the moment. Yeah, I mean, it's he really is uh, the typical modern footballer in that sense, tattooed <laughs> from head to toe, and it's all on social media doing incoherent thing antics that nobody except, I guess, his friends understand, or, or maybe it's I'm just exposing my age here. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, it, it's it, he's a typical modern footballer in that sense. But I mean, he's also very in the sense, in another sense, there's also a positive side to that, and that is that. He's, you know, he's he's got a kid. He's 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 got you know very stable family life. He's very, you know, he he's very that that part of his life is kind of very settled and taken care of, and and so he wants to, you know, he's reached a point in his career where he understands that at twenty four, twenty five, it's make or break now. Um, and he and and given where he thinks he should be and, and his self confidence and and his belief, he thinks he's he's a you know future top world class center defender and he understands that this is his a little bit last chance to 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 prove that. So Nima, do you think this is someone who can hit the ground running or someone that will take a bit of time to adapt to the Premier League? 
I think he will take a little bit of time to adapt to the Premier League uh, because it's simply because it's a completely different game to Italy and Brazil, which are his previous experiences. So a little bit of a, a time will be needed, but he is incredibly focused on succeeding. Um, he's entirely succeed, entirely focused on. Uh, he, he's coming motivated to South to Southampton to prove himself and to take a to start by taking a starting, uh, to, you know, to, to to cement himself in the starting lineup, and then from there on, starting to you know to build and and show that he's a very good central defender, and in order to get a, a move away to um, to maybe a bigger club, which which I think that I mean that's his ambition. He wants to play with a, for the best in the world. So it sounds like it could be a shrewd signing, actually. Yeah, I th- I think it is. I actually think this is a clever signing. It's uh, it's it's one where that doesn't cost you too much, and it's one where you, you can you know if if he has a you know we know how the value in the Premier League players once they you know they can shoot through the roof, and and I think he's a player that if he has a really good season, you could be looking at selling him for forty fifty million in a year if he if he if 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 everything works together and it works for him and he he's able to to show showcase all the talent that he actually has. Um, then, because uh, there was a lot of expectation when he came to Torino, um, and and I, and he is a talented player. He is he is a very good player. Uh, the talent is there. It's just about getting it out. Hi, I'm Ricky Lambert, and you are listening to Total Saints Podcast. Arguably, the best bit of business this window, Dan, though, is James Ward-Prowse signing that new contract. Yes, yeah, an important, a really important piece of business, I think, for, for Southampton to do, even though he only signed a five-year deal last summer. So really, you're just getting a, an extra year. But yeah, of course, it's a really, really important for, for the club to make that statement and for, for Prowse to sign. I think it's in a summer where Vestergaard has gone, Danny Ings has gone. And this is the first, I know, Prowse alluded to it in a statement, but this really is the first time that he's been subject to serious interest and the first time that his name has kind of appeared on the, on the back pages with, with being linked with a move away. He hasn't had to go through that before as a player, so it would have all been alien to him. And the fact he signed that contract, I guess, is shows his commitment to the club. And it's also the club saying, you know, we're not going to be kind of bullied around by the likes of Aston Villa, who are obviously in for him heavily going forward. So, yeah, it's a, it's a win-win situation for, for all parties involved. And I do think had had Southampton been crazy to sell Ward Prowse this summer, I, I generally, you know, I, I think a lot gets said about what messages are being sent, et cetera, et cetera. But that would have been an absolutely awful, awful message if Prowse had been sold to Villa this summer. I think I feel quite strongly that the board, had they done that, they may as well have switched the lights off on their way out because that would have just been absolutely suicidal for what it would have meant about Southampton and where they're going as a football club. So for them to to get this new deal done relatively quickly as well, let's be honest, and and get it signed and get and you know, protect their asset and for Prousey to buy into the vision and, and what what Southampton are trying to do is just yeah, as I said, win win all round is probably the best way to describe it. And a great reaction from the fans today, Glenn. You could definitely tell that they were more behind him than ever. Yeah, it was when his name got read out with the with the initial, um, you know, with with the initial reading out of the team. There was a a bigger cheer than usual, um, which which you know, which is which is a good thing. I, I don't tend to get too excited about contract extensions, just to put a bit of um, bit of a spanner in the works, <laughs> because we, you know we we've we've seen it before. You know the the famous Virgil Van Dijk six year contract, yeah. Oh, yeah, and, absolutely, and absolutely. things like that. But it it does it it fends off. I mean, I never seriously thought he was going to go to Villa anyway with the with the rubbish bid that they put in. They'd have had to almost treble that to get Saints to listen. I think the the bottom line is is that if one of the big clubs puts the correct amount of money down on the table, then you know, but it is it is protecting the value of the player for the for the club. You know, I'm in I'm in danger of repeating what I've said before. You do feel it's slightly different with Ward Prowse, and that he uh, he does seem to be a bit more of an honourable footballer than some of the other ones that we've mentioned recently. And he he is not intending to um, shoot off anywhere in the next sort of two or three years, at the very least. The next week. Yeah, the next week. <laughs> <laughs> there could be a testimonial on the cards. We've not had one of those for a while. No, no, one club man, maybe. 
we've got some momentum to take in to this week, and it's going to be a big week as well because the League Cup returns on Wednesday night. Newport County. Can I just check? Is anybody going to Newport County on Wednesday night? I'm, go I, I'm going to Newport County. Right. Okay. I'm, I'm still waiting to hear back whether I've been accepted or not. Apparently, the press box is is rammed, so I'm yet to hear back whether I've got accreditation, which is never normally a good sign at this this stage. Do the South be- Wales Do the South Wales Argus take up that many seats? <laughs> <laughs> um, what are your thoughts on the game then, Steve? What What on earth has uh, has driven you to get a ticket and drive to Newport on a Wednesday night um, with Ralph hinting at changes too today? Saints Saints has never played at Rodney Parade, um, so. Um, from that perspective, it's a new, it's a new ground. I mean, for me, it's not a new ground. I, I did a game there um, two or three years back when they stayed up on the final day in injury time, um, which was which was quite fun. But yeah, it'll be as I say, the first time Saints have played at, played at that ground. And yeah, I mean, yeah, sure, we'll we'll make changes, and that probably makes us slightly vulnerable. If you look at Newport's fairly recent um, cup pedigree, they they've um, they've done a number on on quite a few much higher placed teams. I mean. Plenty of higher placed teams than us. Uh, Leicester have come a cropper there. Newcastle and Brighton both sneaked through on penalties last season, I think. Um, they've taken Spurs to a replay. Gave Sith, gave Man City a good game either last season or the year before as well. So they're 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 no mugs and they're they're used to welcoming bigger sides to their pitch. And let's also not forget this is the first first game on this pitch that's been relayed over the summer. So um, I'm expecting some absolute carnage from that, I, I would imagine, as well. Should be a good atmosphere, though, because it sounds like the away end sold out. Uh, yeah, I think we've I think we've got about um, about a thousand or so going there. But it's the away end is split. Um, so the initial set of tickets were um, kind of along the side heading down towards one corner and then the and then once once those went they then opened up the uh, the ones behind the goal in the un, in the uncovered stand so um, I'm basically just hoping it doesn't rain oh, it never does in Wales mate no <laughs> you'll be fine you'll be fine and Dan the club will be wanting a good cut run um, especially with the fans because we didn't get that last year so they may make changes on Wednesday night but he'll absolutely want to be progressing in this competition yeah, without doubt yeah without doubt I think it's I think if I remember rightly, Southampton went out fairly early on last season, didn't they? They lost to to Brentford on the back of losing to Spurs. So, yeah, and as you say, they, they had a good cup run last year in the FA Cup, but no one was really there to witness it. So, Ralph will be wanting, I imagine, to use Wednesday as an opportunity to to, to start some of the players that have found themselves on the bench um, in the first two games. Perhaps blood another cup, a few more youngsters. But I always think that they're, they're such kind of banana skin games because this is a, a you know, this is kind of everything to to Newport for this season until the FA Cup comes round and whether they can kind of get into the third round. They have a they 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 just scream, don't they? Giant killers or whatever you want to whatever that phrase is. It's so I, mean, I don't know. I, I generally don't know what's going to happen. I think if Saints don't turn up on the night, then they could be embarrassed. But you'd expect Saints if they turn up, then their quality should do the talking on the pitch, but you never know. I, I've never been to the ground. I imagine it's quite small, close to the pitch. So, yeah, it's going to be um, a fascinating game, I think. And then all eyes move to Newcastle on Saturday. Um, another tricky away fixture, Glenn, but we go into this off the back of the, the point against Manchester United. We've got nothing to be afraid of because they've had a terrible start to the season. Yeah, they've lost two out of two, haven't they, to Villa and West Ham, and they've they've not looked good by all accounts. It's a definite chance for three points, and we have to be positive in um, in trying to get those three points, but it's the, it's the same old thing as we have at Goodison Park in that... It, seems to not matter what we do or what they do, we end up getting beat when we go up there. Um, last year being the, the shambles where we played against nine men for half an hour and didn't have a shot and ended up losing. So um, they've got a couple of dangerous players. You know, Callum Wilson can score goals if he's uh, given the right chances. And St. Maximin is uh, is a player that always seems to give us trouble. But, you know, they, they, oh, they have that Almiron guy who doesn't look good against anyone else, but we seem to make him look like a world beater. Um, and he's, he's a few of those. He's not any good. He really isn't. But you know, we we've got to get close to him. So I think it's if we go in with a positive mindset like we did today, and it, but, you know, let's face it, Newcastle are going to struggle this season. They're going to be probably in and around the bottom six for most of it. And 
in amongst a difficult opening set of games, this is one that we've definitely got a target for three points if we possibly can. My prediction is going to be that Steve Bruce will be moaning about VAR afterwards because that seems to be every game um, so far this season. Nobody got the predictions right last week. So what are we saying for Newcastle away? Do you want to go first, Steve? Oh, God. I mean, Newcastle... I, I love that on the opening day, with all the, with all the fans back, they um, every manager felt absolutely compelled to be attack minded. So Newcastle went all out attack for the entire game and then got completely picked picked off on the break. Um, so I'm hoping they kind of do the same again because I think we can we can yeah. exploit that. Um, so I reckon I reckon it's going to be an absolutely mental three two win. Three two, okay. Uh, Dan, your prediction for the game? I was going to go two all draw. Okay, Glenn. Uh, I'm gonna go two one win. This is dang- this is dangerous. It is, isn't it? This is dangerous. Yeah, we're all being all positive all of a sudden, aren't we? I am gonna go with um, one all. I think the score, but I think they'll um, they strike back as well. So bearing in mind that none of us have got any of these right so far this season, if you're glued to our predictions um, and you're going to put your mortgage on it, I'd strongly advise against that today. So, But we can go there with lots of confidence, can't we? That's the main thing. Uh, some shouts to patrons. Colt Baker has upgraded to a Matt Letizia tier this week. So has Ed Busy. So thank you both. You join Phil Cook as our three Matt Letiz tier patrons. And hello as well to Nick Reed, who's in the Francis Benali tier. My thanks to Steve, to Glenn and to Dan. Look forward to chatting again after the Newcastle game. To find out more about becoming a TSP patron, don't forget to check the website. This year, there's all sorts of different levels, starting with the Bobby Stokes tier for just £5. Don't forget to follow this podcast wherever you're listening. And if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, we'd love a rating and a review. On the socials, we are at Total Saints Pod on Twitter and Facebook. You can always get in contact with us via the website as well. Thanks again for listening. Have a great week and enjoy the games. Because we are